Welcome to the first Pan Mod Bank 2016. I'm Reed Gusto, member of the board of the Philadelphia Area and the Media Association, Pan Mod, and uh, I want to welcome you all here to our first event. Um, first thing I always like to ask is how many people have not been to a Pan Mod event before? Very happy to see you. We hope you come back. We do these every month through the school year, I guess you could call it. And typically, most of them are uh, educational content, a wide variety of topics, technical, um, coding, design, um, work issues, all kinds of things, project management, video and web, journalism, anything related to internet development. We consider our community to be the digital development community Panama's tagline is connecting the digital development community since 1996. We've actually been around that long. Wow. I've been around even longer than that. So. <laughs> um, we have a website, panma.org, where you will see all of our events listed. Um, and there will be, when we have it, an Eventbrite link to so register for the event. We'd like to use the Eventbrite link. I know we have a meetup group, and that's fine, but. If you register on the event right link, it's a lot easier for us because those two systems don't talk to one another. And that way we have a much better idea of how uh, many people are going to show and how much pizza to buy and stuff like that. We're very grateful to our sponsors, especially Wharton. that lets us use this facility and provides our refreshments. So they can applause the work. NBA students paying some astronomical amount is helping us out here. So we're very grateful to them. We're also grateful to our other sponsors who make all of our who are the sole source of our funds. If you would like to be a sponsor, you can go to our website, find the sponsor page, and uh, send us a, send us a message, um, and we will put your logo on there and sing your praises at all of our events. So think about that. Um, we are a 501, uh, we are not a 501c3 uh, corporation, although we are a not for profit. So if you were to give us money uh, as a business expense, that's, that would be legitimate. I'm not a tax lawyer, but that's my understanding. Tonight's event uh, is something that uh, kind of strikes home with uh, a, a lot of people. I can see by the whole room that there was a lot of resonance. And I was trying to write an introduction to the topic. And I was making all these, you know, analogies about being an expert at being a pony. And I just, I, I, eventually I realized I couldn't do it. So I would simply uh, want you to give a warm and my welcome to Amanda Clark and Brianna Morgan. <laughs> I am also one of the Panama board members, and quite frequently I'm one of the people doing tweeting, and I can't do that because I'm busy. So if you tweet for us. Thank you. So we're going to start this off with a little bit of a story, and it's going to be a story about trying to write this talk. So I apologize, it's meta. I hope everybody's caffeinated. Uh, but this is probably a scenario some of you have been through before. Open Google Docs, title a document with something really vague, like a story. Open a new tab in Chrome, pull up Facebook, <laughs> like somebody's cute dog picture, uh, check out something else, maybe the number of tickets sold for your event that's slightly stressing you out with the number of tickets sold. Go back to Facebook, see some lame meme about narcissists, and then wonder if you're a narcissist, and wonder if Doing that instead of working makes you a narcissist. <laughs> and then you see something like this in your newsfeed, and all of a sudden you feel like the biggest slacker on the face of the planet. 
Um, I went back to writing the story and started to think about why I was telling the story again. Because stories are a great way to capture people's attention at the beginning of a talk. Right? And you, when you give talks, you think about all the stuff that people always say about, I don't know, picturing the audience naked, which is not a good strategy and I don't recommend it. <laughs> think about what the worst case scenario is. Uh, worst case scenario is this whole thing goes up in flames and Amanda and I both destroy our entire personal and professional reputations. <laughs> There's also the less bad worst scenario, which is something similar to what happened to me one time in fifth grade. I uh, raised my hand to ask a question, and a hiccup came out instead, and I was mortified for about six years. <laughs> so that can happen as well. Um, but probably not going to happen. So I thought, who else tells stories that are really good? Brene Brown, um, and for those of you who don't know her, is a researcher storyteller. She does uh, social work research, a lot about vulnerability and shame. She always starts her talks off with a story, and then she ties that into her original research. But she has original research. We just have other people's research that we found somewhere. So I was like, all right, well, let's back out from that. It's just a regular story, just a normal story with an arc and a hero's journey, however the hell that goes. I was like, all right, I can do this. Went downstairs in the living room. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I live with somebody who is named the best storyteller in Philadelphia. There's an actual trophy in my living room, and it does not have my name on it. <laughs> and that feeling is what happened. Uh, and that's kind of what it is when you're doing creative work or talking or doing anything in front of other people. So. The real story of how this all happened is I read a bunch of imposter syndrome articles, primarily in women's career magazines or um, online publications, and something about them annoyed the living hell out of me. And so I decided to pitch a talk for Eleconf, which was a tech conference for women that happened in this building a couple months ago. And they decided to let me do it. And then I wrote an article about it, so technically. And then I was talking to Amanda over burgers, and she's like, what is this imposter syndrome thing? She said, well, <laughs> those are actual good dog burgers. They're excellent if you haven't had them. Uh, and you know, Amanda said, well, why don't we talk about this at bar camp? This is what, three days before bar camp? Three days before bar camp. Three days before bar camp. I was like, I, I can't throw a talk together in three days. I said, all right, whatever. So the morning of bar camp, uh, Amanda decided that was the time that we should start designing a slide deck and start <laughs> for a talk. And here we are. Let's go back to the burgers. Um, they were great. You can see the caramelized onions. I think there's some <laughs> Gruyere in there somewhere. Um, when Brianna and I started talking about this that night, I was completely new to the term imposter syndrome. And she explained it just the high level, the elevator pitch, and I immediately had this reaction of like, that's me. Like, I've been feeling like that since I graduated college, maybe even in college. And it wasn't just like, the insecurity of like, oh, maybe I'm not good enough, or maybe I didn't do that project well enough, but it's that like very deep uh, wonder that you have of like, maybe I'm just 100% not cut out for what I'm doing, my career, the things I volunteer for, and someday someone is going to find out and they're just going to tell everyone. And it's all going to come crashing down. So we kept talking and we found out about 15 minutes later as we started talking to our neighbors at the table, that I wasn't the only one that had this reaction. The man and a woman both said they felt the same way. One was in real estate, one was in finance. So by the end of the dinner, we knew three things. Uh, people feel this way. Not just a few people, a lot of people. The advice that's going around, number two, is for us to ignore it, um, push through it, to just be confident, to fake it till we make it, um, and that there has to be, number three, more to this story. So in the three days prior to bar camp, we decided to do a little bit more research and find out what there was um, in the research for imposter syndrome. So we ended up Googling this quite a few times. <laughs> and going down a number of rabbit holes, uh, which is, You'll see some of the behaviors we talk about. We read a lot of journal articles about this. We'll get to that in an imposter phenomenon cycle diagram you'll see in a few slides. Um, but imposter syndrome is basically failing to internalize your achievements or your accomplishments. 
um, or as I like to describe it, the nagging feeling that you're overesteemed, underqualified, and on the verge of being found out as a fraud. The researchers who initially identified this were Pauline Rose Clance and Suzanne Imes in 1978. Um, it was a study done among high achieving women, and this is a large part of the reason and we'll talk about this more later, that women are frequently identified as having imposter syndrome more frequently than men. Uh, but my personal experience and new research indicates that that's not really the case, it's just the research started out with women. So who does it affect? Uh, imposter syndrome particularly affects people who do um, creative work or anything involving being in a public sphere. Uh, actors are really big with it, you'll see in a second, um, musicians, anybody that really has to put themselves on the line. And it gets worse and worse the higher your achievements are. So one example of this is Jodie Foster has said, quote, I thought it was a fluke. It was the same way when I walked on the campus at Yale. I thought everybody would find out and they'd take my Oscar back. They'd come to my house, knock me on the door. Excuse me, we meant to give that to someone else. That was going to Meryl Street. <laughs> <laughs> then, come to find out, Meryl Streep, also imposter syndrome. Her quote is, I don't know how to act anyway, so why am I even doing this? <laughs> so, for your reference, um, in polls done, and this is among men, women, academics, creatives, Pretty much um, sample sizes bigger than we can count. It's about 70%, and we qualify that with a maybe. It's not an exact number, but it's close to that. And I'm sure, you know, by looking around you, 150 people signed up for this talk. We had a sold out event. People are interested in the term. People seem to identify with it somehow. You're all in this room, so clearly you identified with it some, um, for some reason. So it, you look to your left and you look to your right probably chances that you'll be sitting next to someone who feels this way as well. Um, as Brown had mentioned before, this was originally thought to be a gendered phenomenon, something that affected women um, primarily. And while it still can affect women more than men, um, a lot of studies have shown and people have been quoted as saying that they feel like since they're a woman, they have to work harder to potentially achieve less than their male counterparts. Something that we also found in the studies uh, with men were that not only were men feeling like imposters, but they were actually feeling worse because they felt like it was a female-dominated phenomenon, and they, they were feeling like imposters for being imposters, essentially. <laughs> so one thing we um, uncovered in one of the journal articles was what we call the big six. And these are the six characteristics of imposter syndrome. You don't have to have all six to qualify to have this, but two out of six of any of these. So just as we're going through them, make a mental mark of um, which ones you identify with. So here we have the imposter cycle. Um, you can see it starts with a project or a task. Can be given, this could be in school, at work, um, with the organization you volunteer for. Immediately, you become anxious about the task. You feel doubt that you're going to be able to accomplish it. And this leads to two things, which can be overlapping, which is either over-preparation, say you have to give a two-minute presentation at work and you work on it for 15 or 16 hours, that could be over preparation. It could also lead to procrastination. And you could be procrastinating for two weeks for this two minute talk and then spend the 16 hours the day before over preparing for it. So these things can happen in tandem. But generally, since most of these people with imposter syndrome are successful people, you're going to get an accomplishment. You're going to achieve what you set out to do. You probably do pretty well. So you're gonna feel relief immediately. Oh my God, it's over probably how we're going to be feeling at William Street Common in like 45 minutes. Um, you might get positive feedback from your colleagues, from your superiors, um, from people, from friends, fellow students, but immediately you're going to discount that positive feedback for two reasons. 
either you feel like you overprepared, and the amount of effort that you put into it was way more than anyone else would have had to put into it. Some, my coworker could have done this in half the time and probably better. Or you'll feel like you procrastinated for a while and it just happened to come together, so surely it's luck. But you really don't internalize the accomplishment as your own or something that you worked hard for or that your talent had anything to do with. This leads to perceived fraudulence. And it's actually, unfortunately, people with imposter syndrome can experience this increased self-doubt, depression, anxiety, and it's a cycle that continues and continues. And actually, one of the things that we also read about is this cycle can be perpetuated with your colleagues. If someone else has imposter syndrome and you do as well, you might be complimenting each other on your work, trying to build each other up, and instead just feeding the cycle. Right, so to go back to the explanation I was giving about what it was like writing this talk, um, which is horrifying to write a talk on imposter syndrome, but I can assure you, the project or task would be this talk, and then the anxiety, self-doubt, and worry we already talked about, the over-preparation and procrastination kind of happened at the same time. I remember you were actually procrastinating and over-preparing over at the same time by creating this diagram and adding the emojis. That's what that's <laughs> <laughs> the emojis took a lot of work. <laughs> Do we need them? Probably not. They're so but nice. it made sense at the time. Definitely did. Right. And so it was a combination of effort and luck because it just so happens everybody likes emojis. And after we're done this, we'll feel the feelings of relief. Theoretically, some people might say some nice things to us, and then we'll say, oh, you're just being nice, and then feel, you know, really concerned about whether or not anybody actually meant it, and the next time we do this talk or some version of it, then we're going to feel these feelings all over again, and back to the original top left-hand corner. It's wonderful. So that's just number one, <laughs> for those of you who are counting. Which actually, just showing, how many people in here identified with that? Raise your hands. Did anybody not identify with that? Did anybody not raise their hands because they were afraid of what other people in the room would think of you? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, moving on to number two, the need to be special or the very best. Right? This is all based on how other people perceive you. This is really the over-preparation goes into this. Um, also, the concept of being a big fish in a little pond can go into that as well. Limiting, limiting yourself in the circumstances you're in so that you can maintain your position at the top. This happens to people I know like that went to small high schools or small colleges and were valedictorians, people who were always the best at everything they did and then they went off somewhere to a college or a workplace where they were no longer the very best and began to internalize feelings of um, self-doubt because of that. <laughs> this is mine? This is mine. Okay. Um, this is one, this is, it was called Superwoman or Superman Aspects. And we're going to just touch on this here because we're going to dive a little bit deeper into it later. But this is basically the feeling that I know I can identify with of having dozens, maybe hundreds of things on a to-do list that goes on and on and on each day, feeling like you have to accomplish tons of things, you have to do it all perfectly. If you're a parent, feeling like you have to be the best parent you can be and also be the best employee or the best boss and the best, if you're going to school, the best student and also keep your house perfectly clean and also have a great social life and also have a killer Instagram feed and just feeling like <laughs> all of these things have to be done every day or you have failed that day in particular. Um, and that's just a feeling of, of wanting to do it all, wanting to have it all, no matter what. And it's not even doing it, it's doing it and making it look effortless. Yes. All at the same time. Which leads into this one, fear of failure, right? When you have a really long, hundreds of items long to-do list, it's easy to fail. Um, and so people tend to get in a cycle of failing all the time, but making up for it by doing stuff like in quantity, right? The other thing that we talk about a lot is failing fast or failing big, and this is huge in startup culture 
Um, but people don't really acknowledge how terrible it feels to fall flat on your face in front of a large group of people. And the higher you go in your career, the more embarrassing and terrible your failures get. Uh, so that can also lead to the feeling of fearing success because success is for pressure to continue to succeed um, and also because the stakes continue to get higher. Denial of competence. So we were talking before when you looked at the cycle um, of you accomplish something and people may tell you you did a good job. You may win an award. You may get an article published in a journal or a magazine. Um, people might want to interview you, take your picture, publish it somewhere, talk about how great the thing you did was, and the entire time it's happening, either outwardly or inwardly, you're saying, no. I mean, how many people have gotten a compliment and said, oh no, this is an old dress, or oh, my hair doesn't look that good, or no, I didn't do that great of a job on that talk. Uh, like, the meeting went all right, but I could have done better. You're, I think we're conditioned as a society but also people with imposter syndrome specifically to kind of discount the praise that we receive and not to internalize it because internalizing it can sometimes feel like not humble or, or braggy to, to talk about how great you are and to acknowledge that someone thinks you're great. And then the final one of the big six is fear and guilt about success. One really good example of this is um, people who are the first in their family to go to college or be particularly successful in their career often feel alienated from their other family members. Uh, and so that's, that's the most common thing I can think of for that one. You got any others? It's just, I mean, we mentioned this before with the fear of failure. Sometimes people fear that if they become <coughs> successful, if they land that great job, or if they win the award, then they're going to be looked upon and called upon on a daily basis, every week, to come up with something great, to keep producing great ideas, to you know always be on, to kind of be the Superman or Superwoman that they think they're expected to be. So having um, a moment of success is kind of terrifying because it means that you know there's always additional opportunities to fail. But get better, like if you have imposter syndrome, you're obviously going to get better with time because you'll realize that you're doing great, right? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to suck forever. Uh, so this is from a website called This Is Indexed. These index cards are drawn by Jessica Hagee, who does a really wonderful job of explaining <clears throat> complex concepts. So everybody want to take a second to look at that? <laughs> Right. Education, <laughs> along you. the bottom, things you know, things you know you don't know. Right, so the more education you get, the more experience you have, the more things you know, and the more things you know you don't know. Which, if you've been hanging around any kind of space for any period of time, you probably realize it's actually helpful to know what you don't know, because it's way worse to not know what you don't know. Following me. <laughs> right. So this is good, but it also makes you aware of your vast, vast deficits as a human being. <laughs> so we learn about a new subject. Let's say we change careers. We're going to decide to get into programming. We initially, maybe we take a class online, or we start, you know, a master's program. You take a few classes, and you're like, yeah. I got, I'm getting the hang of this. I could probably do anything. But the more we learn, the more classes we take, the more our kind of scope of understanding of the, the industry or the field or the practice, the more that grows, the more we realize that we don't know anything. Or we know a lot less than we thought we did initially. Right. So this is often referred to as the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, there are some researchers who figured this out which is basically that people who don't know very much think they know a lot, and then it's <laughs> what people think they know slopes downward and downward and downward uh, because you realize what you don't know. So I don't know if this is comforting or upsetting, but <laughs> people at all skill levels are equally bad at estimating how well they do. So no one has any accurate conception of how good they are at anything. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's <so> <laughs> 
It's great, isn't it? So the gulf is getting larger, <laughs> not smaller, with your experience. The more you learn, the better you get at your job, the higher you go, the more you're realizing that you still got a lot to learn. And if you're in a position or a career uh, where you need to keep up with the latest technology or advances or research, you are constantly being bombarded with media uh, all over the internet, letting you know that there are topics that are becoming prevalent, there are things that you need to learn, there's software that you need to keep updated with, um, and things on a pretty much rolling basis that you need to know um, that maybe a year ago you didn't even know you didn't know. They're terrible too, aren't they? The clickbait headlines? Uh -huh. <laughs> the programming language you've never heard of that will change everything. <laughs> <laughs> So here's a nice little illustration of the Dunning-Kruger effect as compared to the imposter syndrome. Right? Dunning-Kruger effect, you think you're really good, but you suck. Imposter syndrome, you're really good, um, but you can't tell. We're all screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're sitting there and you're saying, I think this might be me, how does it affect me? Is it something that's going on in my everyday life? We're back to Superman, which is what we talked about before, feeling like you have to do everything under the sun. On a daily basis, this was number three in our list of the big six. Um, a lot of what we do to ourselves, either in a written way, on our phones, in our, in our head, mentally, we're constantly making lists of things that we need to do, we need to accomplish and we set intentions for the things that we're going to do, whether in the morning or the night before. Tomorrow morning I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna get to the gym at six. It's gonna be great. And then the next morning comes and, okay, well now it's 7.30 and I can start getting ready for work, but, and the snowballs and snowballs and snowballs. And the next thing you know, it's three o'clock and you've accomplished four things. And those four things might be great, but you still feel like there's all these things that you have left to do that you haven't had time for. A similar aspect of this Superman or Superwoman philosophy is that people feeling like in their careers they need to be kind of a jack of all trades. Or what was the the, the, the full, full stack, stack? The full stack <laughs> developers. You need to know not just a little bit of all of the aspects of your field, but you need to know a lot of it. You could take a project and do the whole thing yourself, probably. Because you're super warm. In four days. It oh. Faster than all of your colleagues. And here's just like a little tidbit of my to do list. Actually, here's my real to do list. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's important to be balanced. <laughs> this is actually um, a great list. It's on Medium 95 things that I should do every day according to the internet. <laughs> um, and you, we'll, we'll share the link with you guys, but it's... Um... Yeah, this is the first 52, by the way. Um, so it includes things like waking up early after sleeping, REM sleep for seven to eight hours, meditating for 20 minutes, avoiding dairy products, taking sexual health <laughs> shower using paraben-free, sulfate-free shampoo, oil pulling, <laughs> grabbing your pre-prepared snacks. Stretching multiple times a day. Probably meditating at the office. Yes. Prioritizing. Reading the newspaper, exfoliating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when we can't do all of this litany of things that we think we can, we experience some self-doubt, some anxiety, some fear, alienation, isolation, shame. Despair might seem a bit harsh, but it's possible. We don't need to explain this, right? <laughs> so another side effect.
effect of imposter syndrome is that people who are experiencing imposter syndrome are less likely to raise their hands for things outside of their job description or their standard duties in the workplace. Uh, they, there was some research on this done in 2014 in the Journal of Business and Psychology. There's also some previous research in 2005 done primarily among college students, which they're usually who gets research because they're easily available. Um, but women tend to overwork to compensate, like Amanda was saying earlier, and men tend to avoid situations where a lack of knowledge could be exposed. I think I also, um, just on this note too, one of the things that we read, it might have been from the 2014 research, was um, people that have imposter syndrome so occasionally, um, or for the most part, tend to be so like head down in their work and trying to achieve and achieve and achieve, they might lose sight of um, ways that they can help other people out at their either in their workplace or mentoring, um, and they tend not to try to volunteer for new things either because they're trying to do so many things already. Um, or they just don't feel like they want to have the, um, the opportunity to do anything new, which might expose that they know less than they plan. Did you hear that thing where uh, during the blizzard only women showed up to work for the Senate? It <laughs> just it happened to be that of the 70 people that showed up, every single one of them were women. And the pages and the couriers, they were all women. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> no, that's guys. <laughs> All right. So clearly, we're saying you have to fake it till you make it. Yeah, so fake it till you make it is the conventional advice on how to deal with imposter syndrome, and that's what got me started on this whole tirade a few months ago, because it just didn't feel right. Um, and part of the reason is this fake it till you make it concept is fine if you're super early in your career or you're trying to get your foot in the door somewhere. But then once you get there, you have to figure out what to do with it. Um, it's temporary, and it'll get you to the top, but it doesn't help you do your job better, it doesn't make you a better person, it doesn't help you support anyone else. So instead, it's really helpful to back out and think about what your actual values are in your life and in your work, because it's probably not being a fake and doing whatever you need to take to get in the door. It's also helpful to consider what other people value, uh, what other people are looking for in leaders. And these are some of the big ones. Growth, motivation, curiosity, humility, and empathy. And that is fundamentally incompatible with fake it till you make it. So one of the big things that we're seeing now as the way we work and the way we work changes is that it's not specifically about what you know. It's about how you think and your ability to find the answers to questions. I know I have talked to hiring managers and people that I know, my peers who are hiring people that are younger in their fields, and they're looking for people not necessarily that have a ton of experience or have done the job for seven to ten years, but people that are good thinkers and people that will bring um, their own values to their job, not just to know everything. So. Our promise to you tonight was not just to talk about what imposter syndrome is and who it affects and how it feels, um, but the ways to actually use those feelings for good. This is number one, asking questions, good questions. Right, so this might involve asking questions of yourself or of other people. When you're asking questions of yourself, it's helpful to consider what you're willing to give up in order to work on the other things you want to achieve, right? So if I wanted to do that list of 95 things we looked at earlier to live the most balanced life possible, um, what would I be willing to give up in order to get those things? My personal example I'm going to use is oil pulling, which is supposed to have all kinds of benefits. So for those of you who don't know what oil pulling is, it's when you put oil in your mouth and swish it around for five minutes. Or 15 what? minutes, five to 15. What? All right. I'm trying to get off the list. <laughs> right, so it's a, lots of people do it when they're in the shower, right? But the thing I would have to give up oh in order to do that is I would not be able to sing to terrible pop songs in the shower anymore. So I'm not doing that, 
right? So if you're able to think about that kind of stuff, what you don't want to do and what you do want to do and how much you want to do it, you can figure out what your actual priorities and what your actual values are. It's also helpful to ask good questions of other people. And what I mean by that is asking, you know, earnest, actually curious questions. Um, generally, if you're starting a question off with, do you play devil's advocate? It's not a question. It's me trying to look smart. <laughs> <laughs> Another way uh, to ask good questions is to seek out people that are um, in your field or in, have been in similar situations. Um, and that might have a little bit more experience than you. And it could be a mentor, or it could just be someone that's been around the block a few more times. And being able to ask them, um, a lot of times, you know, people who have been in the place in your career that you are now are gonna say that the way you're feeling is normal, and that they felt like this, and that they maybe still do feel like this, but they can also be great at encouraging you and telling you that the steps that you're taking are great, or you could be doing these other things. And to ask questions about what should I be learning and what should I be doing, it's a great way to get good answers and good feedback. Right, so asking good questions is beneficial for everyone. It's good for you, it's good for the people who are around you, especially if you're in a leadership position. Um, and one way to encourage asking good questions is to give better answers. And this is something I see a lot, where people put themselves on the line and, and take the risk of looking like they don't know something, uh, which is still something we all struggle with. And then they get a response that's, oh, well, you know, somebody should have gone over this with you. You should have known this already. Oh, you've never heard of what, whatever the thing is. Um, so don't assume that other people know things already, and don't assume they're asking a question because they're stupid. Just answer a question and try to do it as honestly and as clearly as possible. Um, this is an instance where Jargon and acronyms are not helpful. And next is assessing your actual knowledge gap. So I kind of touched on this uh, with the asking questions, but if you can sit down and write a list of things, and you have to think very positively, what are the things that you really think that you're good at, and what are the things that you really think you need to work on, and how much you know, the things that you need to work on, how much knowledge do you actually need to get? What are the steps that you need to take to get that knowledge? Is it simply watching a YouTube video? Is it buying a book? Or is it something that you feel like you need to go back to school for? And that's something that until you actually sit down and assess that, you might not know the answer. You might just walk around feeling like you, you don't know something and you don't know how to learn it. But until you assess uh, what it is that you don't know, you can't figure out how to fix that. And this is where the Dunning-Kruger effect comes into play again, to remember that you know you might not know how much you don't know. And coming back to that and reevaluating your priorities and your values later can be really helpful. Because sometimes you'll start learning something and you think it's going to be really easy and then realize it's sucking up 20 hours of your time every week. And it's actually not worth what you want to get out of it. But maybe it is worth it. And learning new things is one of the best ways to combat imposter syndrome. And like I said, if you're spending 40 hours a week at your job and you feel like there's so much you don't know, but you just kind of keep spinning your wheels and faking it or trying to figure things out as you go along, then maybe you need to talk to your boss. Maybe you need to sign up for a class. Maybe you need to take some time every week to work on um, of your presentation skills, or to work on your writing, or to work on you know, a specific language that you're learning. But giving yourself time to learn new things and actually building that into like a realistic um, list of to-dos or, or a set of goals for the day is really important. There's also lots of people who have written about this before, um, but learning things in different subject areas from where you spend most of your time can be extremely helpful not just in doing your job well, but combating imposter syndrome, just because it gives you a fresh perspective and you're able to bring new things to the table that other people wouldn't be able to. And that's a great way to prove your value to yourself, is if you're able to bring something up that nobody else in your group has ever heard of before. If it's useful. <laughs> <laughs> and once you've learned new things, or even with the things that you already know, one of the great ways to 
work with feelings of imposter syndrome or to combat those feelings uh, is to teach others. <coughs> and it might be, you know, teaching one of your peers something that you've learned that they don't know yet. Or it could be actually mentoring or tutoring uh, younger professionals or students in your field because there's really no better way to solidify in your own mind that you know something really well than to teach it to someone else because it actually lets you kind of take a look at yourself and get your thoughts out on paper and say, wow, like I could teach this person four things today and I know those things and I can answer their questions if they ask them. This is another good one. This is one that I, I added because I think that it's important. Um, part of the, you know, the Superman, the Superwoman, the, you know, fearing failure, it's thinking that anything less than perfect is failure. And I know that a lot of people with imposter syndrome, a lot of high achieving people, a lot of people who are very intelligent are perfectionists. And we hold ourselves to a much higher standard than probably the rest of the world would or does. So if you can, be comfortable with doing something well or doing something good. Doing it good enough or well enough should be, for the most part, how we can live our lives. Not having to work something to death or to go, to go through hundreds of iterations of a paper without showing it to someone for feedback when you could have gotten feedback on it three days prior and it might be actually pretty okay. There are some little changes that you could make to make it better, but you're actually saving yourself a lot of heartache and a lot of stress over not trying to be a perfectionist. Especially because we try to be perfectionists about multiple things all at the same time. Um, one of the stories that I was sharing with Amanda in, in the bathroom right before the talk, because you know, women always talk in the bathroom, <laughs> is right before I came over here, I was sitting in my office, and I, you know, was putting some final touches on the slide deck, deciding if we should change the font size by half a point. And it's like, oh my god, you know what? I really should have exfoliated before I did this talk. <laughs> and then I thought about it, I was like, that's completely ridiculous. Like, no, you, it, that's absurd. You should mention this during the talk. And then I went back on the other side of my brain to the, whatever was on the shoulder. And that side said, Oh my god, you can't say that. People are going to know you didn't exfoliate. <laughs> right? And this is like the things that we do are, to ourselves are completely insane. And the more time you spend thinking about it, the more you can recognize it and stop it. <laughs> it's stupid. This this is a really big one. So, Brianna touched on this when we talked about giving better answers. Um and when someone asks a question, to kind of understand that they might not know what we know and that we can have empathy for that and that we can feel how it is to be in a position where you don't know something. We have to understand that our coworkers, our bosses, our husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends and friends and people that we see on the street are all feeling insecurities of different levels, maybe imposter syndrome, maybe just small insecurities. but. We're all kind of in this together, and if we can treat people with respect and with kindness and have humility about the things that we don't know, but also understand that we might know more than someone else. And by us telling people that our, that our knowledge isn't worth as much as they think it is, then we're maybe telling them that their knowledge isn't worth very much either. So empathy is very important when kind of working on ourselves and working with the people around us. And it's especially helpful for me to remember this concept that a lot of people are really insecure in a lot of ways. Uh, it's a theme that Brene Brown touches on in her most recent book, Rising Strong, and talking about how insecure everyone is, right? So a lot of times when people are coming at you with questions or they're, you know, being kind of combative or, you know, somebody's like, well, you know, you're your thing was, your paper was great, except all of these things, and how could you make all the, those mistakes, right? That's, that's about them, it's not about you. Um, and it stems from a place of insecurity. And if you keep that in mind, it makes it a lot easier um, to deal with other people and to think about 
yourself and how you're dealing with things or not dealing with them, as it were. Last, this is our last slide, is to lead authentically. And this is something that we, it kind of was the start of this presentation with uh, what Brianna was telling me the very first night that we sat down and talked about imposter syndrome is that the qualities and the characteristics that people with imposter syndrome have and can embody um, and ways that we have talked about leveraging those feelings, they actually can make us better leaders. And not just better leaders at work, but in our groups of friends, in events that we're helping to organize, in um, groups, families, anything, any group that you're a part of, you can be a better leader by taking the feelings that you have and making better choices with how you treat people and being more curious, being more empathetic, and just being yourself. Right, so this lead authentically concept, um, as we mentioned earlier, completely opposed to the fake it till you make it advice that goes around all the time. Right, so thinking about that and being honest about what imposter syndrome is and sharing, um, sharing your own stories with people that you're mentoring or people you're working with can be really helpful. Earlier we were talking about the percentage of people who experience imposter syndrome. I have a bigger count now. There was the article that I did for Techway. There was the talk we did at Bird Camp. Tons and tons of conversations I've had since then. We've had these conversations with hundreds of people at this point. I have come across three people who said that they didn't experience this. And I'm not convinced they were being completely honest with <laughs> right, so Some of them are in this room. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> But it's, it's really, there's so many of us. Right, and so we see all these lists and all this advice about how to be a good leader and how to do work and life better, but we tend to focus on what we're supposed to be doing and not how to exist while we're doing it. And it's a big part of the conversation that's been missing. It's something we need to start talking about or everybody's gonna burn out in about, I don't know, two years. So that's, it for us. We would love to hear from you guys. Um, the last time that we did this talk, um, we it was a 45-minute session. I think it was a much shorter presentation. We talked for about 20 minutes, and then we ran over by about 35, 40, with everyone telling us their experiences. Um, so I, first, I'd just like to say that um, there's another event coming up in a week from today that Brianna is hosting at the Free Library um, called The Design the Life You Love, based on a book. Do you want to talk about that at all? Sure. Just quickly, before we dive into questions. Please, briefly. Yeah, so uh, the event next Thursday is going to be at the main branch of the Free Library. It's based on Design the Life You Love, which is based on a workshop conducted by an industrial designer by the name of Aisha Bursal. And it is a really fantastic um, and creative way to sit down and think about the life that you want to live according to your values. So there's a book as, as well. The, work, the events can be based completely on the book. You can buy the book on Amazon, um, or you can come to the event, and I'll have signed copies there as well. You can sign up. What time is the event, and where is it? 6 to 8.30 p.m. at the main branch of the Free Library, 1901 Vine Street. If you would like to get your free tickets, you can go to designthelifeyoulove.eventbrite.com. <laughs> so, would anyone like to... I've seen hands throughout the presentation and we didn't stop for questions, but would anyone like to share their experience, how it's affected them, where they are because of it? Um, I was going to mention that blogging has actually helped me overcome some of these issues because once you hit you know, publish, it's out there and believe me, it's very difficult to get to that point and it took years to get to that point, but the, the you know, release of having that out there. So for example, I wrote a very personal blog post about my fear of bike riding. I've had a lifelong issue 
with bike riding, and I wrote a very long blog post at librarysherpa.com, and I'm not trying to plug, but I just, <laughs> if it's going to help you by reading that. But believe me, that was terrifying to take something so personal about a fear, but I've received so much good feedback about it, and just to see the, the hits that it gets and things like that. But I've had people say to me, like, you know, I've had other people say to me, I have a fear of like writing too. And again, it was one of those things of, you think you're the only one. Mm -hmm. And so I guess just the whole point of this is just putting yourself out there. Yeah, it's terrifying. I know it's part of the cycle and everything. But once you do, I mean, I've, I've kind of been on the other side. So <laughs> yeah. it's only been within the past year that I've been able to have the, the courage to put things out there that are that personal. That's great. But the rewards have been really great. So I encourage you to blog or find some other public outlets that you can interact with. Yeah. That's awesome. Yes, sir. One thing I've started doing since the new year is, uh, you know, I've suffered from this like just about everybody on the planet to some different degree or another. I'm sure everybody does. Um, <clears throat> but I've started every morning, and I actually put a reminder in my calendar every day for this at 8.45 a.m. is I just do a daily inventory where I do what I could have done better yesterday, a couple things I'm grateful for, and what I'd like to work on today. Now by 9.15, often those things I'd like to work on today are completely blown out of the water by <laughs> everything catching on fire and the, you know, the boss having a bad day or Ryan showing up and talking at the next cube over to me about something really cool uh, or something completely uncool that we both, oddly enough, want to work on. But it's, uh, it's given me the confidence to actually, you know, take on things I haven't. Just a, a couple of weeks ago, our oven stopped working. And in the past, I'd call somebody up or do this or do that. And you know, I know how to debug code. I wonder if I can figure out what's wrong with the oven. So I take off the back and go through and find a little control panel on it. And I actually found a bug in the hardware. Literally. <laughs> a bug in the hardware. <laughs> An actual bug. An actual bug. Oh. Well, many bugs, actually. Okay. We had a little roach problem. We got the poison roach straps where they take the bait back and kill all the others. And a whole bunch of them had died on the control panel behind the LED on the stick. <laughs> I went on eBay. I, I looked up the little part number and I went on eBay and found one for 100 bucks. And I started, you know, pulling the old one off to unhook it and then realized I should probably unplug this big plug behind me and unplug it. And then take it apart, put the new one in, and plug it all back in, and it worked. And I would have never done that if I hadn't started doing that at the new year. I've just been doing it for 2016 so far, but we're almost to February. And they say if you can make it to February, then it's kind of a trend. It's a habit. Uh, so I don't, I doubt this would work for everybody, but it's working for me, and I'm going to try to keep it up. I keep them on Dropbox um, so You're I can access it. them from everywhere. Yeah, I keep them every day. So I can do it on my phone, I can do it on my laptop, and the daily reminder has really been helping. Um, because you don't, you don't want to feel bad about things you didn't do that well yesterday. And you can tweak the format to whatever you want. But for me, it's working. And it just gets every day off with the right outlook. And, you know, it, it's, it's hard to ruin your day by quarter of nine. Well, I do take SEPTA right now. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll throw that out there. It might work for somebody else. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Do you think there's any way to um, – you, you mentioned how it's like this just – feedback loop of when, like, uh, I feel like a fraud, now I'm making all my coworkers feel like one because I'm compensating in weird ways. Do you think there's any way to, like, be cognizant of it and prevent that without resorting to just, like, constantly self-deprecating? Like, you know, like, you know, when we met for coffee the other day, I was like, oh, yeah, I got a new client. Wait, I don't want to make feel like crap to think I have, like, all of this amazing shit going on. But, like, you know, something suck and it just, like, because <laughs> no, you, you constantly feel like you're apologizing for good things and making up for bad things. Yeah, it's, just, thing. it's just being aware. Yeah. I think it's being aware of that and maybe addressing it outright in a conversation. It's funny, I was, um, while you were talking, there's also somebody at my house with my boyfriend <coughs> in the open and I was just doing these really assertive texts. Oh, so it's not? <laughs> it's not <a> <laughs> yeah. But it was just because you guys were talking, I was like, yes, I agree, that is the right course of action to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and for just a couple minutes, it really made a difference. Like, this thing is probably going to wear off. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, but, oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. In the same vein with the, the apologizing, um, and this is a really tricky habit to get into, but if you can get into the habit of 
Apologizing when you do something wrong, and only when you do something wrong, <laughs> it helps. <laughs> As opposed to like being there when someone bumps into you. You stop being, you stop being Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's that, but it's also, the, you're close enough. you know, you're having a conversation with a friend, oh, sorry, I'm talking so much, or assuming the person hasn't been sitting there checking their watch the whole time, if the other person's engaged in the conversation with you, you know, that kind of apologizing, and this, I see this a lot, people apologize about dumb things, and it takes up all of their apologizing energy that they could have used <laughs> on things that are worth apologizing for. Yes. I feel like being in, in as a web developer that that things are always changing, and I feel like you know I'm not keeping up with. Um, I don't know what the good learning resources are. I don't know how to uh, cope with that. And the other thing I want to say, I can't believe after watching Revenge on ABC, I met the real Amanda Clark. <laughs> I started hearing it a couple years ago. I called my credit card company. Like, do you watch Revenge? <laughs> no. But I ended up watching it, and she's a badass. <laughs> uh, I would say to your first point, though, um, <laughs> beyond Revenge, um, <laughs> connecting with someone maybe in your field who you respect, and maybe not even someone that you interact with on a daily basis, but someone who you think is doing a great job and, you know, themselves might not know everything, but they might be able to point you in the direction of a learning resource or a, mm -hmm. you know, a publication that might be where they rely on getting all of their information and figuring out what they need to know next. Um, and just being able to ask questions of someone that you respect and trust could be really helpful. There's a little hack for that real fast. The hack, if you go to your public library, and I know Philadelphia Public Library, I know Bucks County Library, possibly Delco and others. If you go to the, the the e learning area, you get free Linda. Mm -hmm. You get free the free Linda. I, and I'm not, I'm not talking about free Linda like this. The courses you get to download as well. You get Linda.com. It's Linda.com. But so if you don't feel like you're yeah. adequate, go to your library. Don't spend the. I hate saying this. But don't spend the money on Linda. Just go to your, you get a library card for free. They do expire if you only use an email. If you only use electronic, so make sure you go in every three years. Renew it, but other than that, <laughs> nice. then did that come with the library? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Also, to get to that, this, that's something I uh, experience a lot with learning everything as well. I work in public health, which is one of the most interdisciplinary fields that exists, and I also do tech stuff. So the combined lack of knowledge that I have is utterly crushing. <gasps> um, and going back to the imposter syndrome thing, or the imposter cycle we saw earlier. Uh, I frequently get stuck in the over prep and procrastinate thing where I procrastinate on learning the stuff by reading every single article I can find about what the best possible resource is, and then I use all my learning time on that. Um, and so I found that just picking something that I know would be useful and jumping into it fixes that entire problem. I just want to add to that. Like Basically the same idea, but simpler. Stop trying to be good at things. When it comes to web development like in, in tech, I'm sorry, Tim, just plug your ears. He's not so here. Like, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, it's like you, you, you actually don't have to be good, particularly good at, at any of the new technologies. You just have to sort of understand what they do and how they're going to fit in with what you're already doing. And eventually learn it. Yes, sir. And eventually learn it. And eventually learn it, or eventually uh, they'll be reacting. You don't have to learn Angular, and you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just want to feed all that from the uh, design art side, or uh, artisan, or so on and so forth. So you're a painter or an artist, and you're really great with oils. And then you got to kind of pick up how to do watercolor. So you're a great artist, or I think I am, right? That kind of thing with the imposter. And then you just pick up and learn another skill, and the same for web design or web development, like Ryan says, you just kind of keep progressing every, uh -huh. every day you gotta do something. Buck. I found that, um, I think you mentioned her, Brene Brown, she has a TED Talk that I found was really helpful, and I'm watching his TED Talk at my desk, and I almost started crying, because it's a TED Talk on allowing yourself to be vulnerable 
which was the starting process for me to realize, like, oh my god, like, you have, you have a problem. And then you did the bar camp thing, and I was like, oh my god, this is me to a T. Um, and so the, <laughs> so the blogging, um, to go off the blogging thing she mentioned, I did a blog last week in preparation for this, because I wanted to let my coworkers know, because we're all in the tech industry, I wanted to let them know, like, there's going to be this talk, like, you, should be, you can come, it's free, there's pizza. Um, uh, so I posted, I posted a blog post on Facebook, and I have a lot of Wharton friends on Facebook, and I think I might have been out of the office for something, and I came back, and there was a note on my desk, and it was folded up, and it said, thank you so much for posting this blog. I thought that I was alone, and it's nice to know that I'm not. Um, so that just kind of made it worth it for me that, you know, you know, I was able to help somebody else um, realize, I think half the pro half the battle is realizing that like, yeah. yes, it's a real thing, and some of us, half the battle is realizing that yeah, it's a thing, and yeah, yeah, it's a problem, but it's nice to know that there's everybody else. Nope, there was a new In the white corner. Thanks. Um, something that you guys said earlier kind of struck me, and I don't know if it's, you mentioned, maybe it's just ingrained in our culture, and I don't know if it's just sort of, you know, because we're brought up to, you know, manifest our destiny and strive for bigger and better always. And <laughs> just, this? I'm just interested yeah. exactly. <laughs> in your research. Have you found that this is like a distinctly American phenomenon? Have you had a chance to take a That's look at other amazing. cultures and maybe glean some insight from everywhere else in the world? I have come across it a little bit about that, um, not too much. One of the things was a podcast I was listening to the other day, and I could not tell you which one it was, uh, but they were talking about imposter syndrome and that part of the reason we experience it more, or at least we're researching it so much in the States, is because our metrics for success are different, different. and uh, particularly in a lot of, not all, but a lot of European cultures, it's really valued to, you know, hang out and drink wine with your friends for a couple hours. At lunch. <laughs> At lunch, <laughs> or, you know, whenever. <laughs> and because of that, because there are a lot of other cultures where people value that kind of thing, um, it seems to not be as big there, but I don't, I don't really know. I actually read um, one of the articles that I was reading was about game developers, and it was, I think there was a German game developer, and his team was um, internationally represented people that work on the Xbox team, um, developing for the Xbox, and he had said something to his boss, um, they were working on a new virtual reality game with this team of international video game superstars, and the boss says, well, have you guys heard of this? Have you, have you experienced this? And all eight people in the room raised their hand. It was someone from Japan, someone from Germany. It's Meryl Streep and what's her face? Yeah. Her face? It's, yeah. It's and I don't know if it was because it was maybe an uh, American cultural setting. Um, one of the other things that we did read in, in some experience that we had with people giving um, their point of view at the bar camp talk was that a lot of times this um, more greatly affects minorities, and that was specifically in the United States, um, but they, they called us specifically African Americans and Asian Americans um, in the studies that were done with college students were more highly affected um, for different reasons, potentially because of the um, way they were raised in their culture or the expectations they thought were put upon them, um, by society, but I think it's more prevalent than just our country. Yeah, and, and that one too, there's some attribution, it depends on the research you're looking at, but some of it's attributed to people feeling either like they don't actually belong places or that other people think they don't belong places because of filling diversity quotas. Um, and, and that's something that I've had a lot of conversations with people about as well. Um, so that's basically, I mean, in most settings, anyone who's not a uh, cis, hetero, white male. <laughs> most yeah. people in Philadelphia. <laughs> so there's a certain hypocrisy I realize that I have upon listening to this, and it has to do with um, criticism and um, dismissing uh, praise, right? So 
if I see that a movie on Rotten Tomatoes has like 90%, right? So 90 people liked it and 10 people didn't like it. I'm going to go see that movie. No question, right? You if I do person. something and I get like 90 comments that it was awesome and 10 comments that it was bad or one comment that it was bad, I'm like, oh, the person who said it's bad, they must be right. Yeah. All these other people, I don't know what they're talking about, but uh, let me focus completely. I will not be able to get to sleep, right? Even though, so I, I don't give myself the same benefit of the doubt that I get everything else in my life and everyone else in my life. So I don't know how to solve that, but I really see that now as uh, something. Well, I think we realize that we're not going to solve it, and it's uncurable, but we have to deal with it. And <laughs> the yeah, beans. <laughs> um, how do you deal with imposter syndrome in the interview process? Because I feel like you're trying to make yourself seem like I am the best fit for the job. So you're highlighting the good things. And of course you're honest. Like if you don't know something, you don't know it. But you're still heavily highlighting the good things. So how do you leverage that in the imposter syndrome, get hired, and then deal with that when oh. you're on the job? Exhausting. <laughs> um, I think one of the one of the slides that we had that I wanted to touch on, I don't know if Brianna wants to take it next, but um, was the it's not about what you know, it's about how you think. And I think if you get asked a question in an interview that you don't immediately know the answer to, or they're talking about a topic that you don't have enough experience with, you could be honest. You can address the fact that you don't know the answer, but you can also say, This is how I find out. And this is, these are the steps I take to figure out the problem and to do the research and to get you an answer as soon as you needed it. I, I can say when I am interviewing people, it's always trying to figure out how somebody thinks and less about the specific knowledge areas they have within reason. You know, If you walk in, you don't know what public health is and you're trying to get a job in a public health organization, probably not great. But in like, that particular situation, explaining what, how you would go about getting the answer or how would you go about thinking it is way more helpful. Um, because people who are doing interviewing are interviewing a lot of people. Because they're interviewing a lot of people, they can smell bullshit from a mile away. Mm -hmm. So demonstrating what your thought process is. Will help you. And then being able to pay that off if you get the job by actually being a critical thinker and being able to solve problems and to speak up when you don't know the answer to something and ask for help. Yeah, and ask for well, clarifying questions too. If, you're, if somebody's, you know, if they ask about a specific language and you have no idea what that language is, you're like, oh, you're like, could you tell me a little bit about what it is? Like, oh, I'm not familiar with that, but this is how I'd go about doing it. Is there a question on the front here, too? No. Oh, I think she had a question, so. And then. I had you many, but have. Go ahead. Um, I actually just want to tag on to that because, um, like, my own experience is actually the very first week of work. Um, I actually came from neuroscience and then had a public health background, and now I work at a tech startup. And, like, because somehow that's all connected. Um, and uh, I had no idea how I got the job to this day. I'm like, I don't even know why they hired me. And I can tell you that when I had my first like mini review, um, so it's like every six weeks, but mine was like four weeks in or so. Um, I like I had already been reading a lot about imposter syndrome. I talked to my friends a lot about it, and I had joined this organization where I literally did not know anything that was going on around me. And then I had this like moment of like I don't know if it's stupidity or clarity, um, but I was like, look, if I'm if I'm really an imposter what is wrong with me just admitting it? Like, I'm just going to turn myself in. <laughs> I went and told my boss, like, I literally have zero idea what's going on right now. I, like, just, I don't even know why you hired me. Like, I, like, I like to think I'm smart and I can learn and stuff, but seriously, I, what is going on? And his answer to me was, like, perfect. I'm not sure if he actually, like, meant it this way, but, um, like, it was perfect. He was, he was like, first off, you were hired here because the way you think, not because of what you already know. Second, you are like you know probably a lot more than you think you do. Um, and third, it's okay not to know. Like you weren't like you're not expected to already know everything in your like fourth week of work here. Um, it was it was absolutely perfect. And so like I I like I would encourage you like when you're going about your job search, just treat it in the same way. It is 
really like we're looking to hire people right now and I can tell you of the people that we interview you can definitely smell the bullshit when they're just kind of like waving their hands around um, and a lot of people actually ask clarifying questions and it's interesting because I'm like oh I didn't realize that the question I'd asked you was unclear but it's really impressive to me that you've actually thought through this and that's that tells me a lot more than just kind of like a hand wavy answer I'd like to add on to that. Go for um, it. Yeah. I've been through a multitude of job searches lately through various reasons, and I would like to extend you some advice. So when you're looking for particular jobs, I would always try to find a few in, like in your Google searches or whichever searches to find, like, the slam dunk the middle of the range and extend yourself because you want to find the job that's right for you and if you don't extend yourself then you're not going to ever learn more and if you always go for the slam dunk you're you're always going to have the employment but you won't really grow so you want to try to clearly you need a job so you have to apply for the slam dunks, but you also have to apply for the ones that are reaches, too. And when you're in an interview, if you know it's a reach, you're just trying to grow yourself, so that's what you should be focusing on. It's like, a, it's like applying for college. It's like, this is it really is. It's, it's exactly the college. same. Yeah. Aim for Penn and aim for Bucks County Community College. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. I'm saying it's the ones you can get into. And, there's ones like, oh, my God. and that's a really good point that you made, too, because the alternative to imposter syndrome is getting an entry-level job in your field and doing it for 30 years. Right. The same thing. Because you'll be very, very confident in your abilities if you do the same thing all the time forever, yeah. right? Presumably, you don't want to do that. And so this is a thing that you have to figure out a way to deal with. Me? Yes, you. What? So on the bicycle comment, um, yeah. So this is a this is a this is like an extreme case of imposter syndrome. Somehow I managed to actually become an IT professional without like complete college, and uh, that that that's terrifying. Um, because everybody around me is like highly educated, and then I'm interviewing people, and they're like, yeah. So I just got my. Uh, MSIS, and uh, so now I'm looking for my, you know, and now I'm looking for a, for a new job, and uh, in in the IT field, I'm like, I, I, I haven't gotten six years of school. That's terrifying. <laughs> You're like way more than me. Um, so anyhow, yeah, that was terrifying, um, and then it, it it still is, um, but talking about it actually helps. Um, and so I'm not going to write a blog post because I'm lazy, but I'll, I'll share it with 78 other people right now. So there you go. Um, you can share, we can wake your cheers to it after yeah, yeah, at the yeah. bar. Uh, yeah, please. And uh, you know, two of my, two of my, or one of uh, one of my uh, biggest mentors and uh, another person that I that I uh, <coughs> highly respect, uh, both very high up in the IT uh, industry. Um, also, have not completed college, and when I found out about that, it was actually. It was it was just it was so nice to hear. It's like yeah, you don't actually have to, to have you know uh, IT masters in order to. I wrote okay, resumes so. for IT professionals for like two and a half years. So speaking in the case that we have like literally hundreds, that is so insanely common. And every single one of them thought it wasn't. I, I mean <laughs> like literally hundreds of, the, of IT professionals I wrote resumes for like, but I don't have a degree. And we're like, but it doesn't matter if you can do it. Like. Yeah. That it's, is so it's really nice. Really awesome. awesome. Don't try changing careers. But I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's the spirit. So. Can I just add to that real quick? Yeah. Good company, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. So, and everybody who goes to college, especially these days, are, I don't believe will be in a career for 30 years. Oh, I've been in three. Like, I'm 34, I've been in three careers. I'm sorry. I also, I also yeah. had a question. I'm sorry to, to take your yeah, time. Um, the, 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 the whole um, jack of all trades, uh, full stack developer is the one. Okay, so you don't, so, you, so we, and I hate, I hate it when people say full stack developer. Um, but, I, but I use it and I want to hire a full stack developer. Why? Because I don't want to have, I don't want to have to explain everything to somebody. I need somebody who can just go and like do stuff. And it's like, it not, like how do you sort of balance that desire for like, 
yeah, but my employee, I want to be a full stack developer. But no, I don't want like to actually place that responsibility on anybody. So I wonder, what do you do about that? And that kind of goes back to the, it's about how you think, not exactly what you know, right? Because you can have somebody who knows 45 or 145 or all of the programming languages, every single one, and cannot think on their own to save their lives, right? Like, I know a lot of people who are very skill heavy and not so great on the thinking part. So you don't necessarily actually want somebody who's able to do all of that stuff right now. What you need is somebody who can figure out what they're going to need to learn and then make it work. And that's kind of what this is about. Agreed. Yeah, uh, so at my company, we know like the lower level employees, like my peers and so forth. We Can you know, speak up? Oh, uh, my, my peers and so forth in my company, we know like things aren't doing super well right now, uh, everyone's fine and so forth, but uh, management has a nasty habit of always being very, very positive all the time. Oh. They hand out compliments all the time, which is kind of feeding into this. Uh, and it's constant compliments, uh, ranging from stuff from like, oh, you're doing a really good job to almost like, that was a very smart idea. And it's not always, but the constant compliment feeds into this, like, I, some of my colleagues and I can't take compliments anymore. It's like, okay, it's, <laughs> what I'm doing this now? Like, like, get me some results, like, come on. Uh, so, I, should I ask them to, like, to stop, like, giving constant compliments? Like, should, <laughs> like, already, like, well, are they like, giving, I'm, like, is it coming hand from hand with any constructive feedback? Or is it literally just like, great, also great, still great? There's great time today. Okay. There's oh, wow. as much constructive just oh, like feedback. Well, ask for that. Ask for, like, can, I love the praise, but can you give me some, can you critique me a little bit? Yeah. But I think, I think that comes I mean, back I mean, to asking for questions, asking question, asking good questions and asking the right questions and just saying, you said I did a great job. I'm just curious, what about it was great to you? Like, what stood out to you as the best thing? So you're not necessarily saying that they're wrong or that they shouldn't have been complimenting you, but you're kind of trying to dig a little deeper into the compliment and find out, well, what about what I did was exceptional enough to receive the praise? Another way of asking is just to be like, I'm already great, that's fine, but how can I even improve? Okay. How can um, I be greater? To, to bring it through. Uh, yeah. Taking back off the compliments piece, um, I met somebody last year who would like, look me straight in the eye every time anyone of us said something nice about him or something that he did and he just like really genuinely got and smile and say thank you and I was like really taken aback with that because I thought that you know that's like you guys were saying earlier that's kind of like a braggy thing to do um, and I got to know him better and I realized he's not at all a, a haughty individual at all he's a really genuine down to earth guy and I started to think about why he would respond or react that way and it made me like sort of think about what it would be like if I did the same and, and so I started to to um do, do the same to other people when they would say good stuff about my work or things that I cooked or whatever. And um, I realized that initially, it's for me, it wasn't so much about, you know, you're, you know they're saying thank you about something that I did or, or something that I said, but I'm thanking them for taking the time to appreciate me or my time or that interaction we were, we were having. And that was like changing for me and it started to change my psyche. So even if you don't necessarily believe everything you're saying, um, it starts with like, saying thank you for taking the time to like say that sentence or, or have a genuine conversation with me that's that's positive especially in this in this era of like a lot of negative feedback and stuff that we see online and otherwise that's great mm -hmm. it's a great way to think mm -hmm. she's got the pull rotary cuff what she's got the pull rotary cuff so i'm going to cough me? Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't think you were about to pull a rotary cuff. I was trying to be funny. It's how we're so. um, Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I have imposter syndrome. Sorry about that way. Um, I wanted to speak to two things. One was the, the job comment from earlier, and I think one of the one of the things that really worked for me. I was in a. I um, I switched from. That I have a bizarre. Okay, I was a librarian, and then I worked in veterinary medicine for over ten years, and wow. now I'm in tech. Um, so a really interesting path. So typical path. Yeah, exactly. What else can I do with my life? Um, and I, you know, I've been teaching myself how to code, and it's still a journey for me. But 
I, um, I was in a really poor job environment, and what I ended up doing was talking to everyone everywhere I went, and just going, hi, I'm Elizabeth. By the way, I'm looking for a job, so if you know of one, I'm here, it's nice to meet you. And I ended up getting my current job at a startup company because I went to a housewarming party, and I walked in and I said, hi, I'm job hunting, and my <laughs> boss is there going, well, what do you do? And I said, well, it's funny, I do this and this, but I've been also teaching myself how to code, and he interviewed me on the spot, and I, I got hired. Um, and I think That's you awesome. just have to really put yourself out there constantly and don't be afraid to do it. Um, on the flip side of that, I'm also the organizer of Code Newbie Philadelphia, so if anyone wants to come, hi, come talk to me. Um, but I still have yet to show anyone at any of our meetups any of my work because I'm too terrified to do it. <laughs> and you know, you have all these new people coming and they're showing me websites that they've built and they're showing me programs they're working on and they're, you know, they're telling me what they're learning and I haven't shared a single thing because I'm afraid and I think they're gonna think that I'm not smart enough or advanced enough to be hosting this group and it's absolutely terrifying. So you have a GitHub account, account yet? Huh? If you, do you have a GitHub account? Have you posted any of your code? Why I have don't a you? GitHub account. I have not posted. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Close your eyes. No, no, not yeah. doing it. I know. I know. It's, it's, and you know what? I've been working on this, and it's interesting. You know, I've been working on a blog because I really think that blogging would help. Um, but I will sit there and I'll be like, well, this photograph isn't quite right, and maybe my logo is not good enough, and what? Well, this is. It's just not perfect yet. I can't put it up. I can't post it. I can't put it up. You're supposed to ditch. I know. I'm working on it. I swear. So I think my goal is next month I'm going to have that blood up, guys. I swear. Everyone here can hold me to it this whole room. <laughs> something to all of you. So I run Content Strategy Philly. When I started running it, my business card did not say Content Strategist. I was Director of Cultural Engagement for our nonprofit. I had just been going to a lot of meetups and I was the last person standing when the old person left. So, <laughs> so I was That's running what that it. Happened, that happened. So I was running it. And in part because I was running it, I ended up getting a job where my card now actually says Content Strategist. So like what you, you're going through do not feel that the title that you have necessarily has these built-in requirements in it. It's more, are you adding value? Like, at the end of the day, the way I look at it is, was I doing a good job helping people, whether or not my actual mm -hmm. job title had that in it, so. Yeah, and a lot of that is based to and in, in uh, what we think people's expectations of us are, uh, especially when you're in like a teacher-student situation or your audience situation, right? You're supposed to be an authority on something, and if you show your work and it has mistakes in it, which it probably will because you're a person, um, then everyone will know you don't know what you're talking about. But it's so helpful on the other side for the student to look at work in progress or you know hear about what your challenges were. And by not sharing that with people, we do a disservice to them because they think that you are somehow different or special or that they can't be an organizer or they can't be a teacher because they don't know as much as you. So if we're gonna cultivate a culture of good leaders, share your crappy stuff. Yes. <laughs> uh, that is, at least tweet that. Yes. Someone tweet that out. In the brown sweatshirt. Uh, um, yeah, kind of to go off of that, I have two quick comments. Um, about perfectionism, so Jen and I are currently, we work at the same place, and we're doing it, and Carrie does too. We're doing um, a, a an event on imposter syndrome next week, actually, and we've been in, oh, interviewing a people. recon. Sorry? I said a little recon. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We're just going to use this, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've been interviewing some of our coworkers about it, and someone that like everyone looks up to in the company, he was talking about perfectionism. Um, and he was saying, like, there are real implications to being a perfectionist. Like, I will spend five days longer, like, creating this report than I actually needed to spend because I want to make it perfect when really five days ago, like, it was ready to ship and anyone could have used it. And, like, that, there are, like, business implications for that. There are implications for, like, how other people perceive you and then define success for themselves. So I think... You know, you don't have to be a perfectionist. You shouldn't. Well, you shouldn't try not to be. Argumentric. Oh, I interviewed oh. him. 
Hi, the Ross. We're hired. The best, one of the best things I've found to, to combat that is to always try to find a definition of done for the work that you're doing. Um, the just, I had an employer who keyed in on those words, and I, I held on to them to now, just knowing the definition of done so that you have an actual finish point. It helps a ton. That's huge in project management success criteria. It's like yeah. What is done and then don't go on that. Without that definition, it's easy to go into profession. And I, for, yes, you had two. Yeah, and I just Second had point. one other thing um, that was related to kind of like looking for jobs and starting out a new job um, and also creating like a good environment for people to work in. Uh, so Jen and I have the same director. And Carrie. Uh, but, <laughs> but this is related. I was also in my first mini review when I started at RJ Metrics and he told me two things that made me feel just so comfortable about not knowing anything about what I was doing. He was like, first of all, Jenna, we don't expect anything from you. <laughs> you have to know him. You have to know the guy. Uh, it made sense. He means it the nicest way possible. Um, and he was also like, you're going to fuck up, and it's OK. And maybe you don't want to say that, those exact words in your work environment, but like making people feel comfortable making mistakes um, and asking questions, I think, is really important. Sounds like a good leader. He's a really good one. It's a good cookie. Hey, you've had your hand raised for a while. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to sort of piggyback on what Elizabeth was saying about um, the idea of putting something out there when you feel like you don't know what you're doing. I, I've tried to do different types of coding languages, and some of them I've, I've adopted, and some of them I haven't adopted. But when you're coming into something, there are people coming in sort of at all levels, you know? And I know sometimes when I'll come into something, it's like everything that's out there is like at this high level where the people practicing it are already so accomplished and, you know, they're almost, it's like, I can't relate to what they're communicating to me because I'm not at that level. What I'm hoping to find is somebody who's a little closer to my level, you know, who has something to contribute that's a little simpler maybe or, or a little bit more basic so that, um, you know, so that I can feel like it's not this impossible thing. And I think there's a value to sort of putting things out there no matter what level you're at, because you don't know what somebody else is looking for. Somebody else could be looking for leadership that they can understand where they are, rather than, you know, the perfect example of the perfect, you know, technical product or strategy or whatever it is. Sure. So. That's great. Yes? <laughs> um, so the advice you gave about, like, battling imposter syndrome with authenticity. Um, I think that's incredibly true. And I learned that like incredibly the hard way as a sophomore in college. Um, I was part of the uh, National Honor Society for English majors, uh, Sigma Tau Delta. Our acronym was STD. Which was great. Because my phone had like Lindsay with STD, and my boyfriend was like, why do you have <laughs> <laughs> but uh, every year they have a conference, you submit your academic papers to them, uh, and if you're accepted, you, they fly, you fly out and uh, you read it to just a panel. Uh, and it's, it's all other students and like the professors that are the mentors, and uh, you're, you're, they try to group you by theme, um, usually you're just kind of tossed in with other people. And uh, I was presenting a paper that I'd written. Uh, you know, English major. I'd written it about uh, like definitions of chastity in like the Canterbury Tales era times versus wow. like now. It was a cool paper. I don't know. I, I still think it was good. <laughs> and another person next to me uh, in the panel read a paper on like Beowulf. And uh, some person in the uh, panel audience asked a question. And uh, I guess this is for uh, that lady. Um, so. Just connecting the Beowulf story with your like discussion of you know like um, Canterbury Tales stuff. Uh, what do you think like re re <laughs> in terms of like religious freedoms come up in the other person's paper? Like how do you think those two things are connected between you know <laughs> ancient Greece and like medieval England? And I <laughs> ancient, <laughs> like ancient Greece. Ancient like, yeah like I'm sorry Beowulf the Odyssey. The person had written a paper on the Odyssey. Okay, I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm like ancient Greece. Like, you know, she has to be able to know what I'm talking about. No, sorry. The Odyssey and mine was on the Canterbury Tales. And I was like, 
he asks me a question, I've got to answer this. So I start thinking, okay, there, like he's asking, there's got to be a connection. And just the first, <laughs> I just start spouting the first shit that pops into my head. I'm just like, well, I know that um, like Julius Caesar in the, you, you know, um, w w when he first came to Britain, um, he had very much of a, a, uh, a policy <laughs> of letting the pagans continue to practice their own <laughs> religions. And my professor sitting there in the audience, she's like, <laughs> she's like and I'm like, and that's why that's um <clears throat> Yup. <laughs> and after she's like, those have nothing to do with anything. <laughs> those are hundreds of years apart. <laughs> and like this is probably the thing that I'm still the most embarrassed about in life. <laughs> this was like eight years ago. <laughs> and I still, I still talk to this professor and I still occasionally cringe like, why did you say that? Why did you say that? <laughs> and, but like- It was a learning experience. Yeah. It was a wicked learning experience. Like from that day, like I learned, if someone asks me a question that I do not know the answer to, answer. or that does not make sense to me, I'll be like, I actually just don't know. <laughs> or like, let me get back to you. I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm not prepared to answer that. I'll let you answer you. <laughs> Does not compute. Yeah. The ask a question slide we had earlier, that's why that's important. Because when you ask questions that are terrible like that, when you ask people to comment on other people's work they just found out about, like that kind of stuff, it does that to people. <laughs> and they walk around with that for years thinking that they don't know what they're talking about because one person asked them an irre irrelevant question and it happens all the time. <laughs> so there, over here? Yes, sir? One over here. So uh, this is interesting because uh, a lot of people here are younger than me. And I think back in my late 30s or 40s, I, I didn't, we didn't call it imposter syndrome, but I, I had this crisis of faith in, you know, I'd gotten a job at a level where could do this. And somehow I got past it. And I remember um, one of my, I guess it was a boss or maybe a colleague, he started scouting off on this thing called being consciously incompetent. <laughs> and I, I've never heard of possible, but this is, and so he would say, you know, it's one thing to be uh, unconsciously incompetent. That's bad. You're walking around, you're hitting. Not even Kruger effect. And the, yeah. the lucky people are the unconscious and con unconscious competent ones. They're just good, but they don't know why. They don't know how they got there. They could, but they they just seem to go through life in a charming way. And I learned to be consciously competent. And said, don't don't be too quick. You know, it's great to be good at stuff, but try to get more comfortable with being consciously incompetent. And I mention age because I think I arrived about. And maybe this because I have kids, and I have a 23-year-old who's pretty convinced that pretty much knows everything. <laughs> and he's now got his first job, and he's starting to he's starting to have that period of now a few doubts are coming in that maybe it's different than college. I'm absolutely convinced I know less every year, but I know a lot more things to know that I know less. And I think the the blessing of getting older, if there's a blessing of getting older, yeah, is. is I'm much more comfortable with it, and I feel more gracious about it. And so I'm more accepting of trying to learn new things and saying, you know, I don't know how to do So I just throw that out, unconscious, uh, or conscious incompetence. It's like that, that Ronald, was it a Ronald Reagan quote or a George H.W. Bush quote about known knowns? Donald Rumsfeld. Donald Rumsfeld, I know somebody. Yeah. Yeah, somebody that was before. Yeah. 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 Right there? Do you have a question? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, actually, for one, I'm just, Actually, your comment makes me think maybe not so much, uh, only just because you are older than I am. <laughs> but I, I was, cause initially I was wondering how much of social media has, a, has had an impact on this effect on our culture today, um, especially because when people are afraid to put themselves out there because in comparison to the idealistic version of everything else on social media, just the thought I was thinking about, you know, I wonder if that has an effect and as someone who works in social media, I just tell all of you, like, please understand that social media is, like, not reality. It's fiction. <laughs> comparing comparing yourself is. to others on social media yeah. is like comparing yourself to book, or, like, people in fiction books. Like, it doesn't make well, sense. Well, Facebook fucks yeah, with I mean, if you, to get, if you want to get reality, go to the comment section of philly.com. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> 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 
told me this. No, I'm just throwing that out there. And the other thing was just as a testament that your teaching tip, I think I believe it works because I've been dealing with this imposter syndrome and I, so I've been taking the initiative to kind of go out and like do meetup groups and marketing and things and you know just kind of give my input out there. And at first, you know, I, you know people would get back and then they they throw a question out and I was able to answer it and I was like, all right, cool. And then you know it kept happening and then I found after the thing was over, I had people coming up to me asking me more questions. Which I was like, oh shit, I actually know things that these people obviously don't know. Like, that means, you know, I'm not as, you know, incompetent or whatever it is I first thought. So, definitely in terms of teaching, you know, but check out meetup.com, meet up and put your input out there. And yeah. People will ask you questions and when you can, when you, people ask you questions, you'll feel, you'll feel better about it. And with meetup, which this is a meetup as well, we can all learn something from each other. Because if you're going to four different meetups, eight different meetups, you're going to find people with different skill sets. Yep. Right. And read. Okay. Final question. Yeah. Um, there's really more of uh, a comment, which is if, after listening to everybody's uh, speeches on this, it, it, it um, occurs to me that this is one of the reasons why we're all such good consumers to fill that you know, need with things and shiny stuff and technology. Mm. And there's all this techno stuff to buy that are you know, pretty easy to use and you can feel really good about bang, 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 bang. So it's really so. You know, insecurity is good for the gross domestic product. <laughs> I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Excellent, very useful, good stuff to take away, right? Okay. Yeah. So thank you and uh, come back anytime. Well, it's just the <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have. Thank you all for humoring us with that conversation as well. Like this is magic. We have all there are people all who run stuff in here that are talking about how insecure they feel, and that doesn't happen every day. So thank you all for being so honest. I haven't um, played so far. And well, yeah, I know it's great. So and for just staying in the conversation and keep it going outside. Mm -hmm. the where do we find your slides? Uh, we will tweet them out once we update the sources and make sure we get credit. And Panmo will retweet them. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Follow us specifically. <laughs> <laughs> and Emma and myself. <laughs> and I just want to add, um, I'm Linda. I'm also on the board. And Nick, our president over here, wants to remind everybody. Anyone that's in the audience from different groups, if anyone has a topic in the future that they're interested in presenting, please reach out to us on our website. We have a section where you can share your stuff with us as well. Thank you all. Please Thank take you. your uh, your stuff with you. And, show it out. and if you want to take pizza home, grab some. Yes. Please. And if you want Django, come and catch me at the after thingy we're doing. I've got big news. What is three comments? Yeah. Yeah, yeah.